Welcome to A New and Ancient Story, a show dedicated to the transformation of self and society. We're moving from the story of separation to a new story of interbeing. We explore it all, technology, spirituality, agriculture, healing, economics, politics, ecology, relationships, education, because the changes that are gathering today will leave no aspect of our world untouched. For deeper engagement with these ideas, join our community at newandancientstory.net. Hello, everybody. Charles Eisenstein here for uh, another episode of A New and Ancient Story. This time, I've got uh, Pamela and Brown of the Avatar Center, and we're going to kind of uh, kind of interview each other, uh, start by asking some questions and just see where it goes from there. So, uh, welcome, welcome guys. Uh, thank you. Thanks so much for having yeah. us here and, and, and thank you for, for showing up yourself. Thanks. Yeah, my pleasure. Um, so what's the Avatar Center? That's a, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> The Avatar Center is really an international community in the Peruvian Amazon um, that we're working on creating. Um, it's a place that is, has been born really out of a vision to help bring people back to harmony with the land, back to harmony with nature. And out of that relationship, uh, we believe a lot of uh, healing and a lot of um, you know, creative ideas can come out to how we can live in more harmony with each other um, as we move forward into um, creating a new world together. Uh huh. Awesome. I, I'm going to ask a pointed question about that in a second. Maybe yeah, I'll just do myself. Do. It's a very broad topic. So. Yeah. <laughs> um, but anyway, my, my name is Charles Eisenstein, uh, as a lot of you know already. Um, and basically, I when people ask me, well, what do you do? One thing I say is uh, I'm serving a new story, which is also an ancient story. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm a storyteller in a way. Mm -hmm. So, and I think that like everything else in this universe, stories have their own consciousness, their own subjectivity, their being. So I see myself not as the inventor of a story, but as the servant of a story, the story that wants to be born on earth right mm -hmm. now to replace the story of separation, the story of domination, the story of control, the story of humans separate from nature, the separate individual, so on and so forth. Anyway, that's like a very short version. And um, yeah, so that's what I speak and write about. And uh, yeah. we're kind of doing this joint podcast here. <laughs> so I have a question for you uh, that just kind of, when I was listening to you talking about harmony with the land like everybody says that, yeah. Like, yeah. you know, and, and <laughs> it's, it's, I think you're talking about something way, way more than, uh, you know, going out into nature, which is certainly a good thing, but like, I mean, what do you really do? Yeah. Like, well, what, yeah. I, I think we, I think we could both talk about that <laughs> differently. And I, I think there's, you know, when you talk about, anybody talks about getting back to the land and what that really means. That looks like something a little bit different for everybody because it's a very personal relationship. And I think that's for me, you know, I grew up having, I grew up in a suburb, but very close to uh, the forest. And so as, as a very, as a young child, basically the place that I went to kind of touch that great expanse where there were no rules, where I was complete, I felt completely safe. Um, I felt like I could dream without limits. I felt well received. Um, all of these amazing ideas always came out when I was in nature. And sometimes it was just listening to the wind blowing through the leaves, watching the sun set and rise listening to the sounds of the animals. And, you know, these things shaped me. And going into the Amazon is another experience. You know, if somebody already has a close relationship with nature, close relationship with the elements, um, 
for me, I find that nature is an amazing uh, mirror reflection. It helps us to lose this sense of urgent timing of, you know, schedule. Mm -hmm. So we can have space to then be able to see ourselves, the way we behave, the way our uh, re- patterns and relationships are, and all of these different things. It allows the space between um, those constant interactions or, um, you know, with whether we're talking about cell phone waves, electromagnetics, all of these different influences of a city, I feel that it, it so quickly can be apparent to anybody. You step from a city, or if you're, you're, you're in a place like in Pittsburgh, there is a, a 500 plus acre um, forested park. Uh-huh. And so what I really noticed there is you can be in the city in the hustle and bustle, and you literally cross the tree line And I noticed the stress just melts away. Mm -hmm. You know, the air quality is different. I can just feel it. I close my eyes. It's just like it's stepping into a portal, a different world where we can then be like, ah, this is, you know, a sense of inner peace. And a lot of things arise out of that. And then we go back to the city, you know, step out into the, onto the sidewalk and, it's very different all of a sudden we can carry with us, you know, some of the, the jewels that we, you know, are able to bring through that we're able to channel into our experience from the forest and bring them in. But I, what I always find is that it's so important to create a lifestyle, create new communities that are so intertwined with nature so that we always have that influence present. We don't have to remember it. We don't have to go into a deep meditation just to experience that, um, that in our waking life and working in community with other people, um, those things are, are present. So for me, getting back to the land, uh, you know, is very, very important. Um, and that relationship for us to move forward as a people. I'm just going to say, like, that's, I, 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 I fully agree with, you know, um, I don't even agree with the story. It's a piece of story, um, but I, I feel like that what I've I've seen in the last um, I guess twenty years that I've been um, like I, I moved out west. Um, I'm Canadian, and I and I and I moved to uh, the west coast because of the natural environment that I I just love being in the mountains and being in a small community living there. Um, that really helped express a part of myself that I I didn't have as a child living in a suburb on the East Coast. And, uh, and, you know, three or four years ago, when we got to the Amazon, um, that I decided to uh, study more deeply um, the Amazonian medicine, uh, plant medicines. And, you know, that's the reason why also like nature is everywhere. So you can pick any part of the planet to really get back to the land. And um, my family and I, we went there because of its, just its potent, potent ability to heal mm. and, and mm-hmm. to bring us into that consciousness of the earth, of the land. Mm-hmm. So healing our separation from the earth. And without that, I don't believe personally we can do it ourselves <laughs> as a community. Um, giving our, our, our programming and our way we've, we've been in this culture for so long that we don't, we don't have a history, that a conscious history that's been taught to us to be able to relate in a community that's not um, divided by city planning and uh, an artificial system. So, you know, by bringing us into a natural environment that, that also has the influences of plant medicines and other forms of um, teachings, uh, that are more current in the ancestry of, say, some of the indigenous people in the area um, that we can learn from and help us also regain, an, uh, you know, that understanding of how what it is it means to relate to the earth uh, every day as a as just as part of like you relate to your family. Um, you know, it's like nature's coming for dinner tonight. The bugs are there. The, <laughs> the, the, you know, there's, 
there's bugs always <laughs> around and it's not something to um to shun you know it's it's you have to adapt to be able to to really integrate mm -hmm. into your everyday life um the, this natural environment so it teaches in a way its own way of of not being separate and, and mm -hmm. uh and also regaining um, that truth of our, our species, um, mm -hmm. of, of what we, how we, who we really are. Yeah. And I, I don't think in our current um, you know, way of life, um, those teachings aren't really available. Like when I spent over a year there, there's just, there's just ideas that come up when you're no longer influenced by, um, or when you're, it's not even like that you're not influenced by, but you're, it's, it's the lack of influence. You know, mm -hmm. it's, 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 a, it's, it's stripping away all of the influence. So when you spend time, especially in isolation in nature, um, and that's it, it's like going back and forth. And, and for me, the primary reason why I want to create, you know, a communal setting there in the natural environment, because there's a lot of people who go to study Amazonian medicines and they do a lot of isolation diets. Um, but the true, I think, the true medicine for this earth at this time is integrating that wisdom not in isolation but bringing it back and how we relate to each other every day so so you're really talking about um you're not talking about necessarily people like staying there for the rest of their lives uh not that sense of community it's more of um a place where people can uh do the kind of of healing that takes months or that maybe has its own its own pace and rhythm and, yeah. and where they're really um, unplugged from calendars and clocks and, and well and for some and some like some might be called to live there there's not that many I've, I've talked to who really feel like they could live there <laughs> in the uh, jungle specifically like definitely yeah. Um, yeah but you know to do the healing work and then also what you know what I hope for this earth and, and other people is that doesn't, they don't have to live with us, but maybe live with someone else in another community, in another year. Yeah, yeah well, one thing that's coming to mind. So first, so I, I like to voice sometimes the critic and the cynic, oh, you know, sure. because they usually have, we love they, they have yeah, and so I'm going to ask a question and then answer it. Yeah, so, yeah. So the cynic's question is, well, why do you have to go to Amazon for this? Isn't this more just the kind of more colonialism, more spiritual tourism, where you're going somewhere, you're having an experience, but you're probably eating, you know, food, I mean, maybe some jungle food, but mostly you're probably eating food that's been imported, you know, you're going to set up this outpost of a Western lifestyle yeah. that's surrounded by the jungle, but you're not really in the jungle, and, and yeah. you're going to have this experience and put it in your spiritual backpack and yeah. have your healing, and then you're going to go back home and rejoin yeah. society and, and the life that you knew before. And uh, telling yourself that you've accomplished something, mm. um, and so and and not that they're you know, but but why do you have to go to the Amazon and burn jet fuel and live in this outpost and how and and what do the local people think? Are are local people coming to do this? You know, or is it more just white people taking whatever the Amazon has to offer? Yeah. And my answer to that, yeah, or part of an answer, okay. <clears throat> is that. Um, every place on this earth has a special medicine to mm -hmm. offer the people on this earth. Mm -hmm. It's not that there's no medicine uh, um, embedded in the land in North Carolina or Pennsylvania or anywhere on earth. Any piece of land has mm -hmm. that power, but each place also has a special medicine. And there is a time and place in the uh, evolution of, of mass consciousness where particular places on earth carry the medicine of the time mm -hmm. and or for a certain subset of people the, the the certain places carry the medicine of the time the medicine of the age uh and and so there needs to be ways for people to take in that medicine to receive that medicine mm -hmm. and it sounds to me like that's kind of what i'm tapping into what what you're doing you're being called by the land to um, make this medicine available to to the many many people from all over the planet who will especially uh, benefit from it uh, at this time. Mm -hmm. Like you, I want to speak. You go, you, you go. I, I get into that too. You I know. Go. I know. <laughs> we both get into it. Um, I well, 
you know, that's it. There's, there's a lot of different, um, and I'll just come on and say the plant medicine that's most popular right now is ayahuasca. Yeah. And there's many ayahuasca centers. And when I felt and called to go up there and buy land and, and, and say, okay, this is it's like, you know, my dad, because my parents are involved in this and I got yeah. them involved many years ago. And, and I said, and, and he's just like, there's so many, like, let's do something different. And it wasn't actually me that mm -hmm. is deciding. And, you know, it, for me, it partially is um, like, because I've, I've been a yoga teacher and training yoga for many years before this. And I never really had that concept of what, um, like I saw people with, who had a guru, okay? Like, and you know, there was a lot of devotees uh, that I would train with, especially on the West Coast, right? I don't know if you know. Right, that. yeah, yeah. And, and, and so like, and I was like, oh, I'm just not, like I love the teacher, like I love different teachers and I really gain their, you know, connection with them, but I don't, I can't really fully understand what it means to feel like a devotee or a, and you know, in some ways, you know, like ayahuasca did become like my guru. Um, the messages, the information, um, you know, we planted the first, the, within the first three weeks that like, I wasn't, I was no longer traveling, spending more jet fuel, you know, I stopped my travels to plant um, an orchard, you know, she was like, no, you, you know, you got to plant this orchard. So it was mango trees, avocados. So three years ago, that's what I first did was uh -huh. started planting an orchard. And, um, you know, now we have a, uh, and, and, and her, you know, message to me was the, planting a, a large herbal garden, um, medicine garden for the, uh, in the rainforest. And so that was something that was told for me, and that's my message. I'm not saying that everybody has to do this. Right, right. Yeah, everyone has their way, what, what their gift, and that's part of the reason what we also want to help other people do is find out what their gift is, what, what is their skill, what is their range of skills. I'm not saying, like, because I don't believe in the specialization aspect of humans, mm -hmm. um, but what do they want to bring to help humanity and uh, or themselves in their own lives? Can I, I just want to comment on, on something like um, earlier you said that uh, we, we don't know how to do this or something like that. You said um, we can't heal by ourselves or something like that. And also now you're saying, um, you know, you were told to do that just didn't make sense to you. And um, this is something I, I, I think about a lot uh, because Anybody who really has studied the way that our system works and the crisis on this planet falls into despair. Uh, if they're from this culture, especially, they fall into despair because according to what we know how to make happen, through everything we've learned about how change happens in the world, our capacities are insufficient to bring us into, to transition into a, a, a more beautiful world. We don't know how to do it. But that doesn't, but that is only, that only makes it impossible if we accept the, um, I call it the theory of change that our culture, the dominant culture has instilled in us. Mm -hmm. if, we, if we think that it's all up to us, if we think that everything outside human beings is just this kind of random melee of forces and masses and that any order, any purpose, any direction must be imposed by us, if we accept that, then it is indeed hopeless. But mm -hmm. if we understand, if we, as every human culture has, except for ours, really, if we understand that there is intelligence outside of ourselves that could be, for example, in the mountains or in, in the trees or in the land, in the soil, in the water, in all beings, that there's intelligence outside of ourselves that, that um, mm -hmm. can tell us what to do even when it seems, or especially when it seems insane to us, especially when it seems that well, that isn't going to make a difference on the planet, what's, what good is planting a mango tree going to do? <laughs> <laughs> but we just don't understand how the world actually works. You know, we don't... Like, <laughs> right. you know, my, my one friend who I, I write about sometimes, you know, who's gone around the earth planting earth treasure vases, these clay vessels filled with prayers that uh, a mm. Tibetan monk instructed her, this like Tibetan you know, guru who lives in a cave, 106 year old Lama told her how to make these, you know, like, mm. what good is that going to do? When she was given those instructions, she was just like, well, how is that going to help? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the world doesn't work as we thought it was. And, and I, one of the things I, I like to, to, to emphasize is that we need to reverse the, um, uh, 
ontological colonialism that we still operate in, even when people let go of economic colonialism mm. and, and say we should no longer uh, impose our ways on other people, often they still hold on to ontological colonialism, which basically says we understand the nature of reality better than you know rainforest Indians who uh, have all these quaint superstitious thoughts. And yeah, they do live in harmony with the land, but we know better than them the way that the world works. <laughs> you know, you start, start listening, you know, learning how, how, like, how do they make decisions? You know, how do they operate? Mm -hmm. they, well, yeah. well this, this is one of those things that, you know, in my, my first time in the Amazon, I was so struck um, as a child growing up, I had this fascination with with the jungles of the world and with the indigenous people. And and for me, when I was younger, I thought I was going to end up in Africa and you know in in like Gombe or or in the Congo or something. But when synchronicity brought me to the Amazon, and ended up up there, and even before I went into the experienced any of the medicines, I had this you know profound kind of homecoming uh experience you know that was like wow like i'm i'm here and and i found just by being in its vibration it you know a, a message came to me and it was something that was undeniable mm -hmm. uh, going out into the forest and and observing i was out there for four weeks um with somebody that i met um just the night before um i got there and so i met him uh he introduced me to a friend and his friend was leaving the following morning at six in the morning to go into the bush. And uh, he had lived in the, in the forest for 50 years of his life and then was living in a, in a city at that time. And when I observed him as we moved through the jungle and trekked and went from village to village, we you know slept in hammocks out in the forest, I noticed that he was tuning into other senses that I wasn't, uh, that I wasn't using at the time. He knew where the monkeys were. He knew where the water was. He knew different where certain trees were even just by, by listening, but not even, and, and he knew that certain birds were going to be closer to the water. So he would listen. And, you know, to me, it was just this menagerie of, of this beautiful soundscape, nature scape. And, but he knew, okay, over there is that. And here's that. And he just, had this spatial awareness that was completely using these different senses than I was really attuned to. Um, and then after, that was back in 2001, and then so I went back to the Amazon in 2013 um, after kind of a calling to go back. And, uh, and then I met Pamela. And over the course of the year that I lived there, um, there when we were in the, the beginning stages of starting the Avatar Center, I started to notice certain things coming out in me. I started to notice that while I was there, I would have a vision of a snake and I would just be cooking dinner or something like that. And I, would, and I, I got sent like with this almost telepathic message and an image to a certain part of the land and the image was of a type of snake that I had never seen there before. And I normally don't go to this area of the land, but I was like, I'm going to go there. For, you know, I just got this, this signal. I went there, and what do I see for the first time but a, but a six-foot rainbow boa constrictor. Wow. The same one I had in my mind. So these things started to happen, and I started to get messages of there's this animal over here. And, and when I came back, <laughs> Okay, that's all right. I started to notice that it, it translated when I came back to the United States and I was in the forest and I, I, growing up, I had a very close connection with the deer and I started noticing I could sense the deer before I saw it and it wasn't something that I would hear. It wasn't something I smelled or saw, but it was this other sense that was beginning to arise just by I, what my experiences or what I, my feeling is, is when we remove ourselves from kind of the chaos of certain aspects of society and such a rigid schedule and these different things, and we actually are able to open up to the expanse 
that nature allows us to step into just by being around it long enough. It cleanses us. And then it starts to open us up to potentially these other parts of our brain that we're just not activating. Uh, this, these other strands of DNA we're just not using, you know, all these things. I'm not sure exactly what it is, but I know it's something other than what I did experience and do experience when I'm in the city on a regular basis. Yeah. One, one thing I think about a lot is, is how could we, like how more effective could we be as change agents, even in like political spaces, uh, if we tapped into those uh, sensory capabilities, mm -hmm. those ways of knowing. Mm -hmm. um, that might, you know, you, you got a vision and you were able to go see a rainbow boa constrictor. Mm -hmm. um, like <laughs> someone might say, what's the, what's the purpose of that? What does that mean? How well, do you no, but what I'm thinking is, is, you know, if you're in that state of receptivity and perception, mm -hmm. then maybe you would also know, uh, you know, just to like, say you were, you know, trying to stop a fracking project or something like that. Mm -hmm. Um, you would know maybe just where to be at exactly the right place, what to say, where, where, to, where to go, you know, where the key uh, information was that could stop the project. I mean, um, who to hook up with, you know, where to find allies, like all of these. Um, the, I, I just, you know, like to, to kind of, um, I don't think that you can necessarily take it out of the jungle necessarily. I think that it has to be rooted in a connection to land. Mm -hmm. It can be applied everywhere. Uh, right. And, and it, it reminds me of uh, something I, I heard uh, that about the king of Bhutan. This was a Bhutanese man told me that the king is always sure, he says, to spend at least two thirds of his time outside the capital in the countryside in the villages, because he says he's unable to make wise decisions if he's in the capital too much if he's in the city. I'm, I'm just thinking of my own process. Um, I can become sometimes uh, almost like a mental slave to my environment mm. when I'm immersed in, you know, square buildings and hearing mostly mechanical sounds um, and thinking, you know, logistical thoughts about what I need to be, to, you know, when I'm in that kind of modernized state, um, I find that my realm, my ability, my capacity to create is very narrowly circumscribed. But I don't necessarily have to, like you're saying, I don't necessarily have to travel somewhere far away to access nature because nature is actually everywhere. All I need to do is to um, retreat in some way from that kind of conditioning environment. Uh, so one aspect of nature for me that's very valuable is the silence that's underneath all the noises. Mm. No matter where I am, that's always available. Mm. Or my own body, like that's, that's um, nature. So if I have a problem, I can't handle I go for a walk and just get really physical and mm -hmm. and look at the sky maybe mm -hmm. uh, like that's always nature the sky although it is marred these days by a lot of jet trails so it's not, <laughs> sometimes it's hard to find actually um something that is um in a unconditioned state, unconditioned by uh modern straight lines mm -hmm. power lines for example but it is always there. And I mean, I know like people who have told stories about being in prison where they had like one tiny little corner of sky that they could see from a certain part of their cell. And that's what kept them alive the whole time. Like mm -hmm. just any little thread of connection is, is um, a pipeline to the infinite. So I, I find that, but but maybe like deep experiences of going into the into the rainforest and and just immersing 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 in that um, that 
realm that's prior to modern conditioning, like that can tune people. Um, experiences in nature, I can uh, better recognize um, and access the nature that's actually all around us in the interstices of, of the modern world. For us, what I, I've noticed also being like immersing myself in an environment without the sensitizations that or the uh, the amount of influences that, that, that we have in this culture, the thought forms, the um, you become very, very sensitive when you don't have them for long periods of time. And from that space, you can see what arises, what motivates us, what what motivates us to take action, how we end up taking action. That's where, and that's what, that's what we've noticed, like from in, in, in so far as even my life, how, how, how do we take action every single day? There's like, we've talked about like different nutrition diets that um, I've studied as well as uh, practice in the Amazon. There's a very much taking out, going down to very basic, very simple foods. Um, you know, so one, one you can do like a, you know, in, in nutrition, you can do de detox diets or you can do maintenance diets. And I find, you know, living for years in the city, I've done you know, very meditation and yoga and there's a lot of people practicing. And I think it's very essential to actually even keep a, like, you know, basically be in balance uh, in every, every day through relationships with everybody. You need something like that um, to maintain. But when do you detox? You know, when do you fully get to that place where, you strip away stuff that you've been maintaining, you know, and when you, when you actually disembark from um, a pattern that might not actually be serving a lot of people. That's the thing is that I realized that a lot of people who do some of these detox diets in the, in the Amazon or wherever they go, you can do a detox diet in North America in, in nature, you know, there's lots of cleansing meditation retreats. It's just be, giving yourself that time and for, for me, it's the faculty. We're bringing together indigenous knowledge that's also been passed down from, uh, from lines that haven't been interrupted. So bringing them, and what we also want to do at the Avatar Center is bringing in, you know, people like, or just the researchers, authors like Toriel Seisenstein, <laughs> who, who have a different take and perspective on the world that has to do with our culture and more modern perspective and how to integrate that. Right. You know, young people right now, we want to start a youth program because there's a lot of people going for healing uh, in the Amazon, but the, the people like, you know, who like youth who are spending a lot of time on technology these days and not connecting to nature. When, when you take them out into like a whole different area, it becomes like this fascinating world. We're going to the Amazon. And, you know, like planet Earth is kind of, it, it's a big place, but in a way it's, it's small in the universe. And if we take people, youth, and say, oh, you're going to the Amazon. <laughs> this is like so far away and, and you get to learn about all these species and, uh, that don't exist in, in, in your environment and, and um, really create this, um, well, this way of experiencing nature without having access to technology, then... You know, it does provide a little bit more uh, of a chance to say, hey, um, what, what can we do with just nature? And, and, and like, let's, let's because they, they can't just run back home and go, oh, you know, you're, you're in the Amazon. Yeah. <laughs> you, you, you've gone that far, right? Um, so it's, it's a little bit like pushing people to the edge as well, that location, um, the, the edge of comfort. And I've seen it with many people. It does push people's comfort edge. And I think that that's what we, our culture needs is, is, is to get, get, strip away some of our comfort zones so that once those layers are taken off, okay, now what do you do? Now what do you want to create? Let's build up from there, you know? And I'm not saying like we're going to like, you know, I, I want hot water eventually too, like everybody else, but <laughs> I'm not going to do it in a way that like, you know, sacrifices uh, some of the animals down the street, right? After... You know, once you live without something for a while, it doesn't become such a like. Yeah, can't it's not, do it. not so important. Yeah. People, people can come, you know, down to the jungle and they're like, you know, and, and everybody will detox from sugar, a little, you know, a little bit of some of the comfort foods. And even when you're painting that picture of having all of the uh, same amenities, you know, that we have um, in North America or in the Western world uh, down there, we're really. For me, I'm really passionate and 
part of it is because I look at, we, we tried to plant some vegetables and things that we have up north and I was accustomed to planting in New England and it just didn't work. And so I was forced to really over time try things. Okay, that didn't work, that didn't work. And then I really started to gain an appreciation for the local, um, the, the foods and the medicines and the herbs that were in that area. And, and for me, I feel like people can come there and they can really feel that, they can deprogram, they can tune into, you know, I mean, there's such an incredible variety of local food there. There's over 178 varieties of fruit bearing trees in that region alone, um, which is incredible, right? Um, so, that, so anyway, but then take the knowledge of being able to tune into the land, the experience of, of receiving intelligence from the plants and the medicines and the environment, take that back home with them. And that's an aspect of the avatar centers. We all have this inner uh, being inside of us. That is our enlightened state, right? It is the, the part of us that is expansive and it constant communication with everything that ever was and ever will be right. And, opening up that box so that people can feel that and then activating it wherever they go in the world. It's not just about come here and then activate it here and then go back to your, your life, but it will change a person. It will transform us. And that transformation plays out for eternity, <laughs> you know, in, in all of the ways that we affect our relationships and everything we we ever do and so it's it's about activation of purpose activation of our soul and and connection uh, so that we can create something absolutely amazing that that is absolutely possible and absolutely beautiful um, I think that yeah I mean you can you know do meditation in the boardroom and on and you know in the corporate office and things like that but we are not separate minds our being, our thinking, our perceiving, all of that is inextricably woven into the environment. And I think that, I mean, maybe there's exceptions, you know, um, but I think most people, if you're in a cubicle and in a schedule and in a money economy and, and having the relationships that come along with that, Mm. then you're going to start, you're going to be thinking cubicle thoughts, seeing cubicle things, uh, exercising linear logic. Um, it, the, the, this other um, larger realm of perception that you're talking about doesn't come naturally in that environment. No. Yeah. And it's not that, um, I'm not saying that we're slaves to our environment either, mm -hmm. but Um, for me, at least, the I, I need to be uh, deprogrammed and reconditioned mm -hmm. by other environments that aren't what I grew up in. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not it's not even so much. I mean, yeah, like the physical environment is part of it, but the social environment is important too. Like, what do people talk about all day? What am I hearing? Mm -hmm. uh, what What are the conversations that I'm having? What is considered normal? All of those things are, are actually, like, it's hard to see past them. Like the fish that doesn't know it's wet, you know? It's hard to, to, to see that, that reality isn't just those things. Um, yeah, I, I just tend to be a little skeptical of, of the power of yoga and meditation and things like that when inserted into the matrix of our society to really change very much. I think that they can bring people to a point where they are ready for a bigger change. I don't think that they're useless, but I don't think that, that they can. Um, I think, yeah, I think that within that container, they're, they're, they're limited and, and, but, and their power maybe comes in bringing us to a point where we no longer, um, can tolerate that container. Right, right. I, <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Makes us more sensitive to the container. <laughs> it's like, ah. Yeah, sure. But I find that essence of competition in the society mm -hmm. um, where, you know, you know, mm -hmm. 
<laughs> even with yoga easy. being turned into a sport, you know? <laughs> yeah, like it kind of creates a different way of looking at it, right? Like with every perception, with every, with all the education information from all of the spiritual um, figures we had in our society, someone reads it differently than as someone else. And so if you're not actually experiencing it, experiencing them, then just even passing on that information to someone else is like, well, this is what I got from it, you know, and, and this is how I received that. So, you know, even when other people experience, um, you know, uh, a very euphoric state in, in various um, programs they've gone to, and then they try to pass it on and, this, and do workshops and do teachings, you know, and I, I really appreciate that. But I find I find the West has a lot of um, uh, processing. We process. We we process a lot. We have a, a psychotic a, a lot of talk and, and a lot of processing and integration. And, and and you know, if we learn something like that new yoga pose or meditation, we'll we'll integrate it and, and process it. But the depths of it sometimes I find, you know, it it doesn't it doesn't cut in deep enough uh, into the fabric of our programming and the way we do things to actually shift it enough. So we integrate a small amount of, you know, maybe a morsel of like, uh, you know, euphoria or enlightenment. So yeah, this is, and then we try to hold on to it and, and try to disseminate and, and you know, take it apart with our, you know, a part of the brain that maybe is a little bit too logical. And I find that, you know, going into the Amazon and working with the indigenous people, they really are like, there's not much processing or integration. They're just like, <laughs> it's there and it happened. And they're like, okay, let's go, uh, let's go get breakfast. Let's go get like go fishing yeah. or, or whatever they do in a day that they normally have to. And it's a, so, you know, in, in a way, that's what I also noticed that where it's needed that crossover is that we, uh, have been maybe catered to that in the West. We need a little bit more processing. We need a little bit more integrating time than um, than than the cultures of that have gone with uh, very little. Like they they don't they don't need as much, or they just haven't had as much. They got they don't used to. Like, you know, yeah. They, in, the, in those ways. So 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 that's why like those deep medicine. Um, that work sometimes that they do and people get really like turned upside down sometimes not knowing what to do with themselves afterwards and, and there's not a lot of uh, support for that in our culture because it, of course it's been a lot of some of these herbs have been made illegal right uh, and 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 so that's you know another reason why we we need to go other places in the world for other sorts of healing um, that offer things that we haven't deemed as inappropriate or like, uh, like, and not, a, you know. Well, I, I think one reason why people from the West need more integration is that the experiences that they are having with ayahuasca or some of the other sacred plant medicines um, are so violently contradictory to the story of the world that they've been given. Yeah. That, that it's disorienting, you know, they have to like, make sense of it somehow. Mm -hmm. Somebody who's, you know, been born and raised in the Amazon, the the experiences that they have taking ayahuasca aren't necessarily so uh, out of place. Mm -hmm. they're, they're, Very true. It's yeah. not hard to fit those into their the rest of their lives, but but you know, um, for people yeah. from here, often yeah. those experiences are like they see things that they thought were impossible. They have thoughts that didn't exist in their, in their universe of thought, you know? Mm -hmm. and, and so then you're like, well, what do I do with this? Help. What do I do with this? So I, I, I do think that some processing is, um, can be important. Yeah. And then of course, there's also like the shadow side of that where uh, the processing is an attempt to own the experience in, um, to make it your possession and to fit it into the existing conceptual framework that has the ego at the center. Mm -hmm. so, oh, uh, yeah. so it's very and, true. Yeah. And, and so I think that, that I guess a skillful facilitator would, would be aware of that mm -hmm. um, and not allow people or, or not encourage that um, attempt to own or that attempt to, um, make it into a possession of the ego. Mm -hmm. And then there's also the thing about escapism, you know, just escaping into the intellect, which 
isn't actually a way to, to integrate and digest the experience. It's a way to push the experience outside by retreating to a comfortable level of mm. words and ideas. Mm -hmm. so, Puts it in a comfort zone. Right. There's also other cultural belief systems that create this superstitious, um, and, you know, and that's it. That's my, that's my perception, right? It's, it could be, I could believe it as a superstition. And they're like, no, that happened in the jungle. This is what we saw. And you know, they, don't, they don't really want to go, go towards that. And so these plant medicines in both their culture, our culture, everyone's culture, there, there's a, you know, it's not for everybody, you know, and, you know, and I, you know, I'm not saying that this is also the only way. I just found a way, and I think I listened to one of your talks, and it talks about, like, you know, you believing in miracles. You say something about, like, you know, to, to create our own, you know, our beautiful, uh, sorry, the title of your book always <laughs> Yeah, that happens to a lot of people. Own, own, own beautiful. The more beautiful world our hearts know is possible. <laughs> yes. Yes. And and that and that um, I love I love the title when you say it. Um, uh, that uh, the miracle that you know I found through because my mom studied uh, holistic healing. I, I was brought up in a very new age type of environment. Uh, you know, not very like uh, alike the community I was in. So it's a very hush hush, like not to talk about things to look like to be ostracized. And, you know, the miracle for me is that um, this medicine for me has really brought me out into more uh, of a way of, you know, because we all like, just, just like you know, know what we need to say. We know what we need to do. Um, there's fear. There's all these other emotions and belief systems that prevent us sometimes from actually getting out of our comfort zone. And, and for me, some of these client medicines that we've been working with um, help me do that. And it also gave not only proof within myself that I needed to, like, and how I brought in a, you know, a partnership that I love into my life, a baby, like, uh, health, like, there's so many things that it's brought into my life that it's like, okay, okay, where's the, you know, if you need proof, that, you know, uh, and, you know, along the way, you know, I can say it now and say, well, you know, there's, there's, it's not just a, Oh, like I feel good energy, you know. I really feel good energy, and I, I want to spread that. And it's an intangible thing to people when you say that because they don't relate. But when you say like, "Oh, I've you know met my my life partner through this. I've like, been able to conceive. I'm in amazing health." And uh, yes. it's it's just like okay, you know what else? It's like you're living a happy life now. Yes, <laughs> and and that's that's the thing is that. Um, yeah, that, that's where I, I see is the miracle is, is that if, if it can bring you into balance with, uh, the people in your life and my family, I've never been closest to, like closer to, uh, it bridged, it healed the, it's, it healed so much of my connection with my dad. I, I hardly talked to him for 15 years before, before this medicine came into our lives, but it, it brings us back and it, it, it constantly brings us back to that understanding and that that energy that yes this is possible we saw it happen and mm -hmm. you know and, and then let's right. keep moving forward and then and so then you want to transmit that and you discover very quickly that talking about it doesn't transmit it because people don't have the conceptual frame to even take it in so how do you transmit it well one way is to create an environment where other people can have that experience and receive the medicine and also it can be transmitted through your story and through your presence, through the change, the subtle change in the timber of your voice that happens when you've been through a certain kind of experience, <laughs> through, um, yeah, yeah you, 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 you change, you become a carrier of the medicine in in some way, because you are no longer who you were before. You have become you plus the medicine that is in your field. So yeah, so the, the ordinary way that, that we think that, that in the West that we've learned that knowledge spreads, yeah. only, you know, less than 1% of 
of the way that, that knowledge like this spreads. And we spend so much time and energy trying to convince other people uh, using, you know, evidence and empirical reasoning uh, <laughs> that, that, that we're right, that here's what's right and that's what's wrong. Yeah. And then when they have an experience though, that whole conversation becomes irrelevant. Mm. And, and that's what I think we need to, um, at least for me, you know, I really, I mean, cause my, my programming from school that, that the solution to a problem is to come up with the right answer and then present that right answer to someone. Like that's really been strong programming for me. Uh, and I'm, I'm learning to, to trust other ways mm. of transmitting. Like even when in my writing, um, what's more important to me than argumentation mm. is the tone, the voice, you know, the voice under the words. How do I transmit a certain voice? Oh yeah, that's so. I I love that. I love that topic because I listen to tone, and that's that's very like for sound healing. I I did it years ago a, a sound healing program, and my voice. I just I never sang. Um, it was you know I had criticism you know somewhat of, and and I find the tone that we we bring in and just trusting that, uh, trusting our our own, um, which is you know it transmits a, a vibration. And and you can tell with other people, you know, so, you know, it's it's such a, it's it's so apparent when you when you see if someone's really happy or really saying what they're really meaning when, you yes. know, it, it is. And well, and that's you know, I have to say, you know, in the in the plant medicine world, the singing like what comes through, it's it's like a, it's it's otherworldly, and it's amazing to like I sing now, and you know, and I'm like. I'm always shocked. I'm like, I love my voice. Like, it's not even my voice. I don't know. Like, I don't know whose voice this is, but uh -huh. it's amazing. It's, and you know, just with the what it what it how it changes actually the vocal cords mm -hmm. um, that it, it somehow resonates you so to a different frequency. Like, I'm not exactly sure. I'm still learning. I'm yes. not gonna. These are what I call technologies of reunion. You know, that again, yeah. like the the kind of Western modern conception of what technology is, is, is such a I, tiny, tiny band of the spectrum of, of all technology, of all craft, you know, of all human capacities, of, of all of the ways that there are to interact with nature and, and the world. Um, and, and so oh, yeah. you know, you're, you're talking about this completely alternate thread of technology yeah. that is, you know, it has its own lineage, it has its own logic, it has its own practices, it has its own, it, it's, it's, it's this whole other universe. And, and, you know, what is possible on this earth when we really inhabit yeah. technology? Well, and, and this is this is getting a good part of the conversation where I, what I want to invite, because I've had a lot of ideas um, that I'd, I'd want to, because there's a, a palm oil project that's going on uh, a few miles down the road, and it, it started within the first year, and I, I think partially, like, you know, our inner avatar coming out, but that that energy of the avatar of, of coming to, you know, the country, seeing really what's going on, they, they decimated 20,000 hectares, mm -hmm. um, you know, clear cut, and planted uh, palm oil, um, palm, sorry, palms, for palm oil that'll take five years, and you know, the town is split over it. Some people want the work. Some people think it's destroying nature and, and animal habitat. And, um, you know, like, it, it, it's a very contentious issue. And so now I, you know, I, everywhere I go, I tell people don't eat palm oil because it's in everything. Yeah. Um, it, not everything, I, I shouldn't say that, but it's in most products that are sold in, 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 in local or, you know, regular grocery stores. Even organic products have, have palm oil in it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's not, it's not necessary either. You don't need to have problems. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is one reason why I, I, I write and speak about economics too, because like, why is the community divided? Why do they need the work? If you trace back that question, why they need the work, ultimately it comes to because they and the whole nation are in debt. Yeah. So, you know, you produce the palm oil, which is exported. It generates foreign exchange, a hard currency, which can be used to service the debt. And if you took away that pressure, if you took away the debt pressure, then there wouldn't be this, you know, enormous push to 
find something to monetize, to find something to, to, to generate. Um, you know, maybe people would still want to participate. I mean, I'm not saying that, that, yeah. that, you know, no one should be part of a global economy, but people shouldn't be compelled yeah. to, to, you know, monetize their labor and monetize their land yeah. and convert everything possible into salable products. They shouldn't be compelled to do that by a imperialistic system of debt slavery. <laughs> and, and like, so ultimately all these level, all these, all these issues are connected, you know? Yeah. Well, especially when like this town that we're connected to can be totally self-sustainable. It has everything right. you need. So it's like, if they wanted to really put the energy into creating like a paradise, it'd be a paradise, you know, and we wouldn't really need external sources because and, and maybe they would still want some external things, you know, um, but, that's, but that's okay. They would, they would be able to maybe have some sustainable palm oil or some, some, some products to generate the small so. amount. Exactly. A and small and, amount of foreign exchange that's necessary for, for what they really need. You know, yeah. if they didn't have to meet debt payments. Well, and that's what we want to help because a lot of, we buy some of the herbs locally when we, when we, you know, when we produce things on the land and the farmers, like a lot of them are trying to sell their land and they, they, we get like probably like an average once or one, one a week or every second week, somebody trying to sell us land um, down the street from us for a very cheap price. Wow. Um, you know, they're not holding on to land because everyone's going to the city, they, they use, they're going to the city. So they don't see like a viable culture. And yeah. so we try to also encourage sustainability practices where we're like, if we buy some, some plants or say vines, uh, ayahuasca vines off of them, we set plant, you know, you have to plant and plant five, plant 10 for every one you plant so that mm -hmm. there will be some for your children. And, um, so that's, we're trying to like also encourage the local economy yeah. in ways to I, just a new way of, uh, of, of, of interdependence between each other. Yeah. And I think that a lot of, um, you know, really, I think it all, for me personally, I see it's just a lot dependent on relationships and trust because, you know, the mayor, you know, there's greed involved. And so he makes a deal that he gets some money and blah, 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 you know, and, <laughs> uh, you know, I don't exactly know how we will become involved directly in terms mm -hmm. of like, supporting, I think the local farmers and the people that are, um, wanting to live like, uh, you know, just a, a better life in, and, and are already doing it. And they just need, uh, they don't need very much and that's yeah. you know it's easier to for me and i think that's our contribution to that area um to, in general it's it's easier to see so yeah i think this is i think this is really important because when, when you first mentioned oh there's people who you know come with offers to sell the land really cheap and stuff uh part of me was thinking oh well you know maybe if we could find uh, wealthy donors and people like that, you know, they could buy that land and protect it from yeah. palm oil. And, and, but that actually is not very secure because the land isn't just, you know, unoccupied space. The land has to have a thriving culture that is land based on it. Yeah. So if everybody goes to the city and takes the traditional knowledge and skills and relationships with the land with them, and it yeah. disappears and you have a bunch of, you know, wealthy philanthropists buying land, thinking that they're protecting the land. And the land is actually very vulnerable because the people in the land are intertwined. The people are the flesh and blood of the land and vice versa. So if you take away the people and take away the local cultures, then, then there's nobody with, like the people in part are the protectors of the land. Oh, hugely. So, well, the, well, the Amazon itself, right? There used to be 95 million uh, approximately people yeah. in the Amazon basin, which, you know, and they say that this, this area is the lungs of the planet. And now they went down to about 10%. So there's about 9, 8 million or something people. I'm not, don't quote me and somebody out there, right? right. <laughs> what did she die? But it's a very significant, <laughs> my numbers. Are so this is, this is like, this is really important because all, right now, um, you know, there are many places on earth where in order to, protect wilderness, indigenous people are actually being um, removed, expelled from their traditional lands, or their life ways are interfered with and not allowed to hunt anymore because it's now called poaching all of a sudden, even though they've been doing it sustainably for thousands of years. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, yeah, I mean, I, I just want to say that I think that you're really on the right track to, you know, support, 
so yeah, support the local, the, the relationship with the land and not, you know. Well, I think that it, it, you have to live there. Like, that's why a lot of people think that, I'm not saying like, you know, we plan to live there. Well, we did it like over a year and now we're going back for, since our son was born here um, for another, another year or two years. I'm not exactly sure how long we'll be there until we, um, like we want to make that our permanent base because that's, that's the only real way that um, you can affect changes if you make something your home and it's not necessarily just something you visit. And, uh, you know, what we also want to bring in is, 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 is a type of, like, I think I heard one time that how they affected change is they created a festival or something on that. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I was like, oh, that, that's similar to what we want to do is but a ceremonial festival, like bringing in the local healers and in a non-competitive way because I feel like there's that capitalism culture is everywhere and it's really co created a competition for money and tourists and people mm -hmm. and that's why our we yeah we just want to like lower the price and be like hey like come in and let's work together and send that because all the work that these powerful really like powerful people who've done such um disciplined ways of living uh you know with the plants and the earth we bring them together and we say let's focus our energy on actually like you know, helping this area, um, you know, whether it be through, you know, you know, in ceremony, that's what, that's where I've, I, I've seen like really big changes happen because there's a lot of ancestral healing that I think needs to take place on all levels. Um, like what I've noticed in ceremonies is that there's a lot of um, thought forms that get passed down, like uh, generation after generation to the point where it compounds and then sickness starts to form the body and it's it's very repressed um and and it's it's not quite it's in the subconscious and all those subconscious thoughts are actually it, it's from generation to generation that's in there and so mm -hmm. you know in, in working with each other and, and saying okay like about ideas of work and poverty and scarcity and whether it be what you know you had said once artificial scarcity yes. or actual like oh no i have proof i i have only a pair of shorts to my name scarcity you know um it's still the same inner it's the same feeling that exists so you know bridging those with it you know from 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 not just our generation but from many generations and i think that's what it takes to do this type of healing work is immersing yourself and you know you don't you only do it people who come down and say okay i'm going to commit myself for you know a period of time aren't only doing it for themselves they're doing it for their families and their communities mm -hmm. um, and so it just yeah, yeah i want to uh, i think um i want to keep it keep it to about an hour or so um, <laughs> before, we, before we go um, I think we got some really interesting ideas here in the mix. And um, if people want to find out about the Avatar Center, if they want to go to Brazil, uh, Peru. Peru, is it? Okay, yeah, we didn't even tell you, you didn't even say where you are. <laughs> <laughs> if you, if they want to go, go, I mean, like, is How do we find this? Yeah. yeah. It's, um, well, yeah, we have uh, we have a website. It's in the process of being developed, but people can go to the site right now. It's avatarcenter.com. That's A A T A R, and it's center spelled with an R E, so C E N T R E dot com. Um, you can also find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash the Avatar Center. Okay. And we have an Indiegogo campaign coming up, so you can look the the Avatar Center up on Facebook or on the Indiegogo uh, to cool. support us in our endeavors. All right. Well, this was lovely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, was, that was beautiful, yeah. yeah. Well, thank you for, for spending this time with us. Are you <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, you don't need. Who's this guy? Yeah. What's his name? His name's Xander. Xander. Oh. Yeah. Hey, real. Xander. Hey, hi. Hi. Hi, cutie. Hello. Hi. Yeah, <laughs> there you are. <laughs> yeah. 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 A baby, that's what you are. Yeah. <laughs> His middle name is Bear. He's a definitely a part of it. Uh, <laughs> Big bear spirit. Yeah. Mm. <laughs> All right, well, um, yeah, thank you, Brown and Pamela. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I think I think your your final uh, 
statement was a perfect way to end it. I really. Beautiful. And good, good luck on your project. Really uh, yeah. Yeah, keep in touch and tell us, tell us how it progresses. Yeah, we will. Mm -hmm. when, we, when we get to, the jungle doesn't have that great of an internet service. So when we do get out. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I, yeah, I appreciate you and your work, and I and I hope it, your podcasts are well. Are, I'm sure they're broadcast all over the world. And, I don't know. It's just a, it's a new thing, but, but you know, most of if people do want to find out more about me, it's my website's charleseisenstein.net. So okay. Okay. Where to go? Awesome. Yeah. yeah, I will let our our community that's forming and uh, yeah and and yeah in future definitely. Our, our programs in 2017, we wish to continue that um, development in uh, the next couple of years to bring in more people as, as, the, as the place grows. But in, in, a, in a good conscious way, not like this. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Expansion is not always needed. No, it's not. <laughs> Maybe it's not necessarily better. Yeah. All right. All right. Well, have a good right. Okay. Have a day. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. You've been listening to A New and Ancient Story with me, your host, Charles Eisenstein. To engage more deeply, you can join our community on newandancientstory.net, where we have live chats, forums, meetups, and all kinds of other tools for collaboration. If you want to find out more about my work, then visit my website, charleseisenstein.net.